Hey there. So this is Wednesday's devotion. This is Don Pearson and Don Counts. And we are in the, um, well, I don't even know what they call it, Counseling Center Missionary House of the William Carey Baptist Association. It was a good place to come. It's already dark outside, and Don and I are going to do several um, films, devotions tonight. Uh, today, it's a lot of information, so you probably want to write this down going to be quite a bit of scripture. Uh, as we talk about legalism, Phariseeism, Judaizers, whatever name you use for it, um, as we talk about it, the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, I probably need to give them or give you kind of the trail of the gospel coming to the Gentiles and what it was working against. And so there's probably some pieces missing in this, um, but I'm going to try and hit the high points of how the gospel eventually gets to us, the Gentiles, and how the battle of legalism has been a major part of the struggle for the gospel coming to us and still is. And so let me just walk you through it. I believe that the message first is revealed in John 3, 16. God sent His Son to, for the world. Uh, he loved the world. He, Jesus came for the world. But when you look in the Gospels, it's very obvious that, as Paul would say, that Jesus first came to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. And in Jesus in His own ministry, it was primarily a... A Jewish ministry, a ministry to the sons of Abraham as the fulfillment of the promises were made to them. And though all nations would be blessed through Abraham, God comes to this group of people because God had made promises uh, to, to these chosen people and thereby the gospel would come to us. So what is this trail of grace? That's what I like to call it. This trail of grace that comes to, that eventually comes to where you and I are today. Well, um, as I said, if we, we're going to skip around, I'm going to try and do my best to be in the in a chronological order. So first in John 3, 16, Jesus' words to Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. God loves the world. And I don't know whether Nicodemus actually heard that or not, but in any Pharisee's mind, as we will find, that God loves the world. No, God loves the sons of Abraham. Um, but that was an incredible message to that Pharisee in that moment. But it was a very private message between Jesus and another Pharisee, and a Pharisee whose heart was already having questions about the legalism, and was looking for grace. And Jesus talks to him about being born again. Well, the very next chapter is the woman at the well, who happens to be a Samaritan, who is, um, she's neither Jew nor Gentile. She is, a, she is a mixed breed. But an incredible story of grace, as in very early in Jesus' ministry, he makes the point that he has to go to Samaria. And he literally goes there and looks for this woman and there by a city. And the disciples are just amazed that he is talking to this woman and that he would want to go through that area. But the gospel is moving in the direction of the Gentiles. And then in Luke chapter 10, you and I encounter a story that you and I know well, and that's the story of, or the parable of the Good Samaritan, where Jesus talks about the, the scribes or the Pharisees and the priests who pass by, but they don't do anything because their legalism prevents them from. But Jesus shares with us that the Samaritan, who actually is good, he does what is right. He does what is beyond the law. He does the act of love. He loves his neighbor. And then we jump over to Matthew, Matthew chapter 15, verse 21 through 28, and we find this Gentile, yes, a real live Gentile, not a half-breed, but a pure-blooded Gentile, comes to Jesus 
looking for deliverance from her daughter. And Jesus literally says, I have not come for you. I've come for the Jews. What do I have to do with you? And, and she makes this incredible faith statement. It says, even the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the table. And Jesus says, I have not found faith like this in all of Israel. And Jesus shows grace to this Gentile woman. And that's our really first encounter. Well, I think I skipped one. It's our second encounter with a true Gentile. The first, the other encounter was with the centurion soldier who loves Israel, loves the people, loves the Jews, as he is described. He has a semblance of faith in who Jesus is. He's built a synagogue. He's a God seeker. And in Matthew 8, it tells us about him coming because his servant is paralyzed and in agony, which means that his servant has had an injury of some sort, is in great pain and paralyzed. And Jesus also says, I've not seen this kind of faith. If you remember, he tells Jesus, you don't have to come, just speak the word. And Jesus speaks the word. Those are really our first two encounters of not half-breeds, but real Gentiles. This Gentile woman uh, for a daughter, a centurion soldier for his servant. And then in Luke 17, we encounter Jesus with ten lepers. Ten lepers. Uh, they all go. Jesus sends them away to do what they need to do for healing. But one of them is healed on the way. They seem to be, all be healed on the way, but one of them returns. And, and the one that returns, Jesus calls him the foreigner. Is it only the foreigner, the, the stranger, the Samaritan, which means that he, he lives in Samaria, but he evidently is not of no Jewish descent. He's, a, he, he's not even a half-breed. He comes to give God praise and once again, Jesus embrace. Well, that leaves us in the Gospels. The Gospel leaves us still with Jesus dying on the cross, raising from the dead, and it's all an audience. Though the Roman soldiers are there and involved and they're watching, it's primarily a Jewish a sons of Abraham thing. And it stays like that through the resurrection. And then there's Pentecost. And Pentecost, the... Uh, the followers of Jesus who are gathered all are, are able to speak in the languages of those that are around. Now, these are all Jewish seekers. They're either uh, converts to Ju Judaism, God seekers, or they're Jews that have been scattered, but they hear the gospel. So it's not a pure move, but it is a move of the gospel leaving Jerusalem, leaving Israel beyond its borders. Well, then we come into Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Even though God, Jesus, had told them in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, those are two important verses, by the way, Acts 1, 8 and Acts 8, 1. They're pretty easy to remember, 1, 8 and 8, 1. Acts 1, 8 is the Acts Great Commission where they are told that they will be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, and, and, and on into the ends of the world, into the areas of the Gentile. They don't get that yet. Um, there's Pentecost. The gospel begins to spread. They still think it's just a Jewish sons of Abraham thing. But in Acts 8, 1, because of persecution, the church is scattered. But in Acts chapter 8, 1, when it's scattered... It's only scattered into Judea and into Samaria, um, which are areas where Jesus has, has been and the gospel's been already spread. But it's also in Acts chapter 8 that we encounter a deacon named Philip who by the Holy Spirit is led to catch up with a chariot with an Ethiopian eunuch who himself has been returning from Jerusalem where he has been worshiping. Even though he's African of descent, powerful ruler, though he is an African of descent, Gentile descent, he's evidently a, a God seeker. He's been to Jerusalem 
to worship. Well, he becomes a believer and he returns to his home place as a believer. The gospel is moving in the direction of the Gentiles, but it's still not there. Next chapter is Acts chapter 9. And Acts chapter 9 is a crucial, critical moment in the life of, of Gentiles. You see, uh, the resurrection, the, the crucifixion and the resurrection and Pentecost are, are major. But at that time, up to that point, they've only been Jewish um, activity, Jewish knowing. But with the, with the call of Paul on the road of Damascus to be a missionary into the Gentiles, the whole world opens up again. For you and I, that Damascus experience brings understanding to you and I about the cross and, and the resurrection. Without Damascus Road experience, you and I probably would have been still left out. But God chose the Damascus Road experience and He chose a Pharisee a legalist, one who is thinking he is doing everything that would please God, but God is not pleased, which is an incredible message in itself that this Pharisee who is all about pleasing God, but he's not even, it's not even close, he's actually en enraging God, has to have a Damascus Road experience in order to encounter, and it's all about him reaching the Gentiles. Well, Acts chapter 10 is, is the story of a Gentile named Cornelius who also a centurion soldier. He's, he gives alms, he prays, uh, he's a God seeker, and this time it's Peter. You would have thought with Acts chapter 9 that the next one would be Peter, but see, Paul's not ready. The church is not ready for Paul. Peter is a leader among God's people and has been. He's been the rock, and now God calls him through a vision not to call these foods unclean because God said, don't you call what I've called clean, unclean. And yet in the law, God had declared those things unclean. But this is no longer living by the law, is it? And now you and I become clean. And he goes to Cornelius and his whole household receives and the, and the Holy Spirit falls on them just like it did at Pentecost. And Peter and those ones that are with him are amazed. They don't know what to do about it. Well, they go back. There is in Acts chapter 11 verse 19, we will encounter some of our beginning of our verses. Listen to what it says. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to no one, listen, to no one but the Jews only. But guess what happened? But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who when they had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists or to the Gentiles to the Greeks, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Isn't God's province incredible? From chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11 of Acts, it seems to escalate in the direction of the gospel coming to the likes of you and I. Well, when we come to Acts chapter 13, well, first of all, persecution comes to the church. As soon as the Christians begin to preach the gospel to the Gentiles and Gentiles start coming in, the persecution begins to rise. Uh, the Jews, from the Jewish section, persecution begins to rise because they don't want the Gentiles. They don't even, that doesn't even fit in their mind that Gentiles can be saved. So in Antioch of Poseidia, Poseid let me say that again, Poseidia, Poseidia, Antioch and Poseidia, the Jews reject, but Gentiles ask for more. Listen to what it says in verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words about Jesus might be preached to them the next Sabbath. 
Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. That's the beauty of this trail of grace to the Gentiles. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. These are the Gentiles begging for, and they all come. And when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas, and here it is. Here's that now another nail in the ground for you and I as Gentiles. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, talking to the Jews. But since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Incredible movement. Verse key, verse 46 and 47 are key verses in this. Well, the persecution goes out the roof among from the Jews against Paul. And then in chapter 15, what is historically known as the Jerusalem Council. You may have never heard that phrase, but the report comes to the Christian church in Jerusalem that masses of Gentiles are coming to faith. And the Jerusalem church, which is Jewish Christians, they have a problem. The, there is a group, as it says in verse 5 of chapter 15, but some of the sect of Pharisees who believe rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. So here are these legalists. They were legalists before they came to Christ. When they come to Christ, they're still legalists. They're still talking about it's not enough to have Jesus. You've got to add something else. And when they hear about the Gentiles, these Jewish Pharisaical legalist Christians demand the law. They're known as Judaizers. You will encounter them in various places in Paul's letters. They constantly raise their ugly head. If God was to describe them among us today, he would probably describe them not as legalists or as Pharisees today, but as Judaizers. Judaizers are anyone who wants to put upon you and me more than grace. You must not more than the work of Christ. You've got to have more. Well, the Jerusalem church met and they'd made a decision, a pretty bold decision, and that decision is found in verses 19 and following, and this is what it says. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things that are polluted by idols, in other words, a just stay away from worshiping anything of the other gods. Stay away from sexual immortality and from things strangled and from, from blood, which was also about the sacrifice to foreign gods. And, and then that was pretty much it. And that was the way it was sent. But the Judaizers are never happy. They hound Paul. They are basically the ones who will help join forces with the other Jews to turn Paul over. They didn't like Paul because Paul was all about grace. So the next time we encounter them is in Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, 16 is a key verse, and then 21. Let me read to you what verse 14 and this is about when Peter comes. Remember, he's from the Jerusalem church, a leader in the Jerusalem church. He's a Jew. He was there with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. But Peter's still having problems with the Gentiles and what they should do. And so, verse 11, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him. This is Paul. I stood to him in his face because he was to be blamed. For certain men came from James, which were Judaizers. He would eat. He would, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when these Jewish Christians came from Jerusalem, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite or the legalist, the Pharisee, the Judaizer with him. 
so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as a Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? A good thing. And basically, the bottom line is, if you are chosen to be saved by faith, by God's grace and grace and faith alone, then why in the world would you make others have to be saved by faith and the law or legalism? Verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now, this trail continues, but that's where I'm going to stop. Here's the problem with modern day Judaizers or legalists or Pharisees in our church today. Uh, they're going to agree with this. They're going to say it's not by the Old Testament law, but they're going to have say this next word, very common, but, but. And then they will add to what they believe a Christian looks like. Now, it's not the things of the heart. It's all uh, mostly of the external. They don't, they don't sing certain songs. They don't wear certain clothes. They don't read certain books, on and on and on, and that's the way it's been. They, had, they, they have a form of religion, a form of godliness. They deceive and convince many, but it's all the works of man. We're going to end our devotion today with that, and, and as we continue this trail of grace, let me remind you, the work of Christ is more than sufficient for saving me and for you. Anytime I seek to add to it, then I am declaring that His work is not sufficient. His work is sufficient for you and His work sufficient for me. Love you. Stuart Chapel.